in a world where a church can't afford to be sued comes a closely reenacted group of hero stories. Their mission is clear. Their budget, low. All right, so due to budgetary constraints, we can't spend a lot of money on special effects. These get cheese curds? Yeah. yeah. Ronald cheese curds. Yeah. Water, one cheese curd, water for you. I'll buy your water for you. Yes. Guys, there's a problem. My spider sense is tingling. Look over there. But their message could change everything. <laughs> so you can laugh. I, I'm a little worried that I'm just getting a lesson in humility up here. Um, last week and this week. <laughs> but we are in our At The Movie series, and I'm sure you haven't been able to tell as you walked in, and we have to inform you of that. Um, but we have jumped in, both feet, in the deep water, and it's probably a little cold, and we're a little shocked by it. We're having a lot of fun with this, though, and we have, we have really embraced it. And we're going to talk about our, the Marvel movies. We have four Marvel, mov Marvel movies that we're going to apply God's truth to for the month of July. And we're just going to have a lot of fun while we do it. And some of that fun is going to be embarrassing, and you guys can laugh at it. And I hope you do, because we did laugh at it as well. I want to let you know that we have to reenact some of these things because of copyright laws and algorithms online. And so we're, we're um, closely reenacting them. We're hoping that we're not too closely original that we get pulled down on Facebook or anything like that today, because we know how close that looks to the actual movie trailers. So today I get to talk to you about Spider-Man and how we respond to problems. So that's my title of my message today. And I went to see the Spider-Man movie with my family um, in like December when it came out. And we had a really good time. The movie theater was packed. And as we came to the end and they come up with a, the saying that, that Spider-Man always comes back to what his uncle said is with great power comes great responsibility, right? And the whole movie theater is like, yeah! And I'm like, this is so cool. I've never been in like a cult classic music movie theater. Like with all the, everybody's like knows the whole story. And I'm like, this is so much fun. My husband's like, why don't they be quiet? And I'm like, this was a lot of fun. But it's like, that's Spider-Man's theme. It's like, with great power comes great responsibility. And so that's where he moves from. And whenever he gets off track, he comes back to that. And so I'm looking at that and saying, what do we do as Christians? When we get off track, we go back to the basics. We go back to the gospel. And what is the gospel? I mean, maybe you came in, you're like, that's a word I've heard. I think I know what you're talking about. I'm not really sure. Or maybe I don't know, even know how to articulate it. But the gospel message is this, that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what does that mean to sin? It's like if you look at a target in archery and they have that bullseye, you know, they usually it's like a red bullseye right in the middle. Sinning is missing the mark off of anything that is not in God's plan and not what God wants us to do. So it doesn't matter if you miss the whole target or if you're just off by a little bit, right? When you play arch, when you're doing archery, it doesn't matter. You didn't hit the bullseye. So when we don't hit that bullseye, we've sinned. And it says all of us have sinned. So we're all, we talk about at the foot of the cross, the, the ground is level because all of us are in the same position. None of us are like, oh, I got it all together. No, we all have sinned. We all have missed the mark. So then we go on to um, next verse in Romans. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. So because we missed that mark, the wages or the payment for that isn't like putting a dollar in the swear jar. It is death. It is eternal punishment. It is eternal separation from God. That is not a, that's a huge penalty that we have to pay. So if I miss the mark, that's my, that's my penalty for it. That's what I had to pay. But God makes the way for us and says, Romans 5.8 tells us, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So then Christ comes and says, I'm going to take that penalty for you. So you don't have to die for your sin because you missed that mark and you sinned. You don't have to pay that penalty of death. I'm going to pay it for you so that you can have eternal life with Jesus. So you can go to heaven. So we have eternal life with God. And then our responsibility in that 
is Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A lot of times you might hear, Are, is that person saved? Like you may have heard something, you're like, I don't even know what that means. That's, that's what it means. It's like we're saved from death to life. And so when we talk about a salvation prayer, we're talking about confessing our, with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in our heart that he, is, he was raised from the dead. And then we're saved. Like that's our only responsibility. God does all the work. Our responsibility is just to act in faith towards it. That's it, is to accept that gift. So that's where we come from. That's where we start. That's our foundation. Just like Peter Parker and Spider-Man have that foundation, we have our foundation. So, but once we are saved, we say that prayer, all our problems go away, right? You guys don't have any problems now, right? Everything's good, right? No, everything's left, no. Now, it's not good. We still have problems. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world full of sin, and we are struggling with our own self. And we have lots of different problems. So we're going to talk about how our response, how we respond to those problems is really important. So first, we're going to look at a very closely reenacted scene <laughs> from the Spider-Man movie, <laughs> the most recent one, um, done by our freshwater Marvel actors. And you can feel free to laugh at this if you would like. It's totally fine. <laughs> Action. Excuse me, sir. Uh, Peter, we saved like half the universe together a few years ago. I think we're past using the word sir. Okay, Steven? Okay, I'll allow I'll that. Uh, when Mysterio revealed my identity, um, it kind of screwed my life up a little bit. A lot of it. And I was just wondering, I don't know if you could do this, but I was wondering if you could maybe go back in time and make so that he never did? Peter, we messed with the continuity of space-time to resurrect countless people. You want me to do that again just because your life is a little messed up? It's not about me. I mean, this is really hurting a lot of people. I mean, I, my, uh, my Aunt May, Happy, my, my best friend, my girlfriend, their futures are ruined just because they know me and they've done nothing wrong. Oh, sorry, Peter, but even if I could, I no longer have the time stone. That's right. I, I'm really sorry to bother you, sir. No, 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 you didn't. Forget about it. Oh, he will. He's very good at forgetting things. Wong, you've actually generated a great idea. What? The ruins of Kafka. The ruins of Kafka? It's just a standard spell of forgetting. It won't turn back the time at all, but at least make everybody forget you were even Spider-Man. Seriously? That would be- No, not seriously. That spell travels the borders between known and unknown reality. It's too dangerous. You use it a lot less than you think. Remember that party, that full moon party on Kamatage? No. Exactly. Come on. Just leave me out of this. Fine. Uh, nice knowing you, Spider-Man. Wait, excuse me? The whole world is gonna forget that Peter Parker ever was Spider-Man, including me. Uh, can't some people still remember? That's not how the spell works. It's really hard to start changing at mid-casting. So my girlfriend's just gonna forget about everything she went through? I mean, is she even gonna be my girlfriend? Some amazing special effects, right? <laughs> so here's the problem Peter Parker was faced with. Peter Parker was was outed as Spider-Man and by um, I can't remember the guy's name. What's the guy's name? Mysterio, yes. Couldn't remember his name. So he was outed, and this created a huge problem for Peter Parker because now everybody knows he's Spider-Man. Some people are really ticked with him. And, you know, he gets, like, stuff thrown on him. His, his friends' lives are changed. They can't get into school. They're coming, you know, they're trying to get into college. His family's life has changed. And you see it seems altruistic as he starts it. He's like, oh, my family this, my family that, my friends that, my girlfriend this. Until he's like, everybody's going to forget everything. That you're, that you're Peter Parker. And he's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. No, I really want what I want. Like, I really want all of this stuff to happen the way I want it. And I just want it back the way it was. And I, I'm going to be selfish about it. Now, it wasn't his fault 
that he was revealed, right? The, the problem wasn't something that he did himself. It was somebody else did it, but he had to reap the consequences of that, right? He had to walk through some of that stuff. And instead of like, and we didn't have it in this scene, but instead of even making a simple phone call, he went to make, let's change the multi-universe, which I don't quite understand all that, but that's like space-time continuum stuff. Um, but instead of just making a simple phone call to a college and like taking responsibility for his life, even though things were difficult, he was like, let's change everything for everybody, right? Because that makes sense. Like that makes a lot of sense because he was just being selfish. Plain, simple facts. Because how we respond to problems does matter, and some of our common responses are not the greatest. So here's our common responses. Um, controlling behavior, and maybe you recognize some of this in yourself. Controlling behavior, demanding perfection from other people, or feeling entitled, like, I deserve that, I should have that. Um, trying to control everything around me. Um, achieving behavior is being a workaholic, being excessively busy, can't sit still. I like to work at a problem, I'm this person. Like, I'll work and work and work to try to fix it. That's me. Um, the other one is isolating behaviors, withdrawing, zoning out. If you've watched eight seasons of a show on Netflix this week, that's probably you. <laughs> um, or disassociating. And then we have people-pleasing behaviors, keeping everybody happy. Um, codependent relationships where you're taking responsibility for somebody else's life instead of letting them do that. And um, you can be easily exploited because you're not taking responsibility for your own life in those kind of those situations. So those are common ways that we might respond to a problem that's not great. And Peter Parker had some really great qualities. So he was, he was funny. Like if you look at like some of the Spider-Man comments, like he's super funny in, a lot, in most of the shows that I've watched. He's intelligent. He cares about people. He's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, right? He's like the dude. And he's, he's, he's a nice guy. But then he has some other qualities that are not so good, where he's like, he's a sore loser. Doesn't like to lose. And he's also a sore winner, because he like taunts people when he wins. Like there's all kinds of things in there. And he's, he's selfish, um, and he's a people pleaser. He wants other people to like what he's doing all the time. So he's, he falls into a lot of those things that we just talked about. When we face problems, our character flaws are revealed. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but I can go through life and think that things are going pretty good. You know, you're like doing your normal stuff. Kids are doing their normal stuff. Everything's going along just fine. You're like, I'm good. I got this. I'm good. Until something happens. And then you have to react out of that. And I like, I was, I, I like to carry like all the grocery bags into the house. You know, at one time it should be an Olympic sport. And you're like, I'm really strong. Carry all in. But then you like drop the milk on the rug. And it's like, you got a gallon of milk on your rug. And it's like, well, then what kind of character comes out of me? <laughs> right? Or... Um, I'm an East Coast person. I am used to driving a little differently <laughs> than the people in the Midwest do. And so I get caught between Lester Prairie and Laconia without the ability to pass somebody. That doesn't always bring out the best character quality in me. Um, so there's little things that happen, and sometimes my instantaneous reaction really shows me where my heart is and who I am. And it reveals those flaws in my life. So what is character? Character is moral excellence and firmness. See, it's really important that we define the gospel when we start. Because morality right now is my truth. It's like, what is my truth? What is your truth? And then we have no, this moral relativism. There's no real truth. When we, when we identify ourselves as Christians, we're identifying ourselves as standing on the word of God and saying, this is truth. Because I'm going to tell you that the word of God tells us that the heart is deceitful above all else. So my truth is going to be a mess because I can deceive myself to believe that it's okay. Not only that, but I can deceive everybody else around me and say, this is a good thing because of this and this and the other thing. But what does God say about something? And that's why we have to know that our morality comes from the Lord. And if we don't start there, we're all talking in different terms. And so we start with the gospel, we start with God's doing, we say we believe in the scriptures and what God tells us to do, and that's where our morality comes from, and that's where we find excellence. So Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So this is us starting with the gospel. Like we're starting here, like this is where we're at, and then we're going to go in the very next verse. 
And it says, not only so, because we're boasting in what God's already done, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we look at that and we're like, so we, we also glory in our sufferings. So it's like, so we were walking around saying, yay, things are really crappy right now. And I feel really great about that. I'm going to glory in that. It's like, we're not glorying because of what's happening to us. We're glorying in it. Like we can be in something that's really hard and know that God is with us and that's okay then. Like we can be okay in that. We can glory in that because we don't have to worry about it because we know that God's going to continue to work. So this perseverance piece is like, we're going to, we're going to persevere. I got a little, little slide here that gives it like, so we have the suffering or the trouble or the trial that we're going through leading to perseverance, leading to character and leading to hope. So we go have the problem. We persevere through it. God builds character in us and we have hope. So the reason this is important is because we don't go through things just for no reason. So we have hard things that happen in our lives. If I have hard things that happen in my life and there's no hope in it, like what do, like I, I don't even want to live anymore. I don't care because it's too hard to do that if there's no point. If there's no point to anything, like why would I even care? I wouldn't even try anymore. But God gives us hope. And as we persevere, which we're going to look at the definition of perseverance, is perseverance is a continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. So this is telling me that we're going to fail sometimes. Like we're going to get someplace and we're going to, we're going to try to persevere through it and we're going to sometimes fail. Um, I have an example for myself. Like I was, my, I've been, I was a stay-at-home mom for many, many years and I homeschooled my kids and I'm pretty sure that one of them was three at the time because the three-year-olds are the worst. <laughs> they, they have the worst attitudes and the worst mouths and they talk back then and you're like, what is going on with my lovely child? And my kids are good kids. They're not bad kids. They, you know, like, so it's not like they're terrors or anything. But I was having a particularly tough day and I was at the stove cooking and I'm... Um, you know something's wrong because I was cooking. <laughs> so I was working to fix stuff because I was upset. And I don't even know if I had yelled at the kids or if I, I was just in a bad mood. And I'm like sitting and I'm cooking and I'm in this terrible mood. And I'm like, everybody around me is just crying and whining and all this stuff. And I was like, I hate this. And in that second while I'm cooking, God was like, you control yourself in your own attitude. And I was like, oh, yeah. And the way you go is going to lead your kids. And so if I am having a poor attitude, my kids aren't going to improve at all today. Like I am, I am setting the temperature for my house. And I sat there and I was like, and I felt so convicted that I was not doing what God wanted me to do that I stopped right there. And I was like, oh, I got to really change that. And I, and I was like, I got a better perspective from God. And, and I changed how I was, what I was doing. It was, it was like this about face kind of moment that I remember very vividly that I was able to do that. But I was only able to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, not because I'm anybody that's great about it. It's just that God convicted and I was like, okay, I don't want to do that. But I was confronted with my own character flaw there. And I was persevering even though it was something I was failing at that God wasn't leaving me there either. So we have purpose in our suffering. And then God gives us that Holy Spirit, which we talked about in the other verse. But when we get the Holy Spirit, we get that at the point of salvation. So when, when we pray that prayer and we decide to follow Christ, the Holy Spirit is poured out on our hearts, he says. He's poured out on us. And he gives us the power to walk out our faith. It's not because of anything that I'm really good at. It's because the Holy Spirit's work in us to change us. So godly responses to, um, to problems in our life. So as we look at something and we're like, how are we supposed to act? And we know how we're not supposed to act. How are we supposed to act? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. This is how we're supposed to act. And this isn't like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It's, a, it's almost a state of being and how we're acting is, a, is how, what God is doing in us and we're acting out of that. And these, this is the fruit of the Spirit. So if you talk about fruit trees, what kind of fruit does an apple tree have? Apples. How about a, a pear tree? Pears. 
So as children of God, as people who have made a decision to follow Christ and have gone from, from death to life, this is what we should be showing to other people. So as we go around in our lives, no matter where we're at, the Holy Spirit resides in you, and we should be seeing those things in our own lives. We should be seeing the fruit of the Spirit. I should see that I'm loving and patient and kind and good and faithful. We should be seeing some of those things. If we don't see any of those things, maybe I have a problem. But that is the Holy Spirit's work in us. We don't come morally excellent without God working in us. We can't do that on our own because we deceive ourselves. And we have that hope because the Holy Spirit being poured out on us. Because we don't have to rely on ourselves and we don't have to try and fail and say I'm bad because God is for us. And we've talked so many times lately about how God is for us and he wants to change us and he's for us. And in those circumstances when we can measurably change some of this stuff because I don't all of a sudden become, okay, I had this experience and now I'm completely loving, right? That's a, or I'm completely joyful all the time, and, or patient. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> um, it, we never get to a place where we just arrive at one of those. It is an increasing thing that we see in our life so that next week or next month or next year, I'm going to see myself being more loving or more patient. It's not something that's just all of a sudden happens and we're perfectly that thing. We are being changed constantly, and God is giving those things to us in increasing measure, and the Holy Spirit is helping us with that. So we're going to look at James. I quote these verses a lot, and, and you know, it seems weird. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Like, it, just, it seems weird to say that's a joyful thing, except for if we know God's working, it is a joyful thing, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So God tests our faith through some of those things too, and he sees what's there, and it helps us to stand firm on the things that God is doing in our life too. So when God does something, he, he can confirm that in you, and you can test it and be like, oh, I did better this, this time than I did last time. Like, I did a better job. Like, God is really working. And it said, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So there's a purpose to all that stuff, so that you can be mature and complete, right? It's like it's not without hope. Sometimes when we go through difficult times, there's not, there's not like a, a moral right or wrong to it, right? It's like we, we have tough things that happen. And um, I, I shared a story at the other services. My, my husband had open heart surgery in uh, February. And many of you guys know that and have prayed for him and helped our family out. Um, he was in the hospital for, it was about six weeks. He was in the hospital 32 days of that six weeks. It was, it was so hard. And, and you, like, I go through that trial, and he goes through that trial, and our family goes through that, and you go, what, what are you doing, God? Like, sometimes you sit there, and you go, what am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to figure this out? Like, what are you teaching me? Why am I going through this? Like, what am I missing? I don't know that I really know everything that God is doing during that time right now, because we're still trying to walk through some of that stuff. It hasn't been that long. We're still trying to figure out what maybe God has done th through some of those things. But one of the things I can tell you is that I watched my friends and our community live out the fruit of the Spirit to our family. People who sat with me while my husband was in surgery. People who came and visited him and prayed with him and prayed with us and cared for my kids and did all those things. People who gave to our family in ways I can't even measure. And I watched God work in other people. I watched the fruit of the Spirit in other people. And it wasn't about God convicting me at that point. It was about God encouraging me and saying, this is who I am. I am for you. And I'm going to learn because somebody else is showing me. I'm going to learn how to stand by somebody in a circumstance like that because somebody did it for me. They showed me the fruit of the Spirit while I was going through a hard time. And so it's not, a, it's not sometimes that we have to figure it out. It's that God is just blessing us with this so it encourages us to do the same. And we learn from other people. So if we, any of us lack wisdom, we should ask God who gives, it to us, gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So in those times when there's not a moral right or wrong, when the scripture doesn't say it, we had a lot of decisions to make. Like how, do, like, how do I take care of my kids while my husband's in the hospital? And how do we decide on surgeries? And who's going to be there? And we're an hour away. Each, you know, one way is an hour. And it's, it was just crazy. And like, you're saying, God, what do I do? You ask for wisdom. 
This is my favorite thing to do because it says that God will give it to us generously. So when we don't know what to do, who should we ask? God who's going to give us wisdom generously. And he's going to do it without finding fault. So I don't have to worry about doing it right all the time. I don't want to have to worry about getting it right or having the magic whatever to know that I'm doing everything right so that God will let me have wisdom. He said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to find fault. I will give it to you. I'll give you wisdom because you ask for it. Then we go on to verse 6. It says, but when you ask him for that wisdom, I put that in there, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as the wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. So we have initially put our faith in God for salvation from that, from that death to life decision. And then we grow in our faith. But sometimes we don't put our faith completely in God. Sometimes we put our faith in our bank account and God or my abilities and God. And we, we, it's a divided loyalty. It's like, well, I got this backup plan because, well, you know, I got this and that and the other thing going on. And we have a backup plan instead of really trusting God for what God can do. And it's like, and then we're going to be tossed back and forth by the wind and the sea. It's like, if you think about that and you think, if I'm putting my loyalty in something that will not reap the benefits that God does, God is faithful. It's like, my bank account isn't going to be faithful to me. It's like, that's going to dry up. That's going to go, people are going to fail me sometimes, but God is not going to do that to me. So I can be steady, like we talked about earlier with character. You can be steady in it because we're relying on God then. So how we respond to problems matters because it reveals who we are. Good or bad, it's revealing who we are underneath. It allows us to glorify God by displaying those fruits of the Spirit to other people so that they can identify God in you and be encouraged by it. It's like you're bringing Jesus where you go when I do that. And the other thing is our faith is tested and strengthened because when I test something and I know that I know it, it strengthens my faith. It's like I test being loving to somebody, and I was like, wow, I did better than last time. It strengthens me to do more the next time. It it encourages me in my faith, and it strengthens that. So it's really important for us to to look at how we face our problems and face them with a godly character on the Word of God, that our moral standard is there, and we start with knowing Jesus first. So the last thing I say is, like, you don't have to be a superhero, Right? You don't have to be, I don't have to be, I don't have to like dress up in that costume again. Well, I will, but I don't really want to. (laughs) Um, But you don't have to be a superhero for God to do supernatural things through you. Because he will if we put our faith in him like that. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word and how you teach us in the very practical ways on how to walk out our faith, God. I ask that you would help us to display more of the fruit of the spirit as we go, God, in increasing measure that we would respond to problems with that godly character, God, and that we would, um, we would be listening to the Holy Spirit's voice in our life. I ask that you would help us to share your truth with the people around us, God, that it is your truth and that it is true and we can count on that. It's not something that's going to change. It's not something that we're going to be blown around by, but it's steady. And I thank you for that steadiness and that we can trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.